Hello, I'm Alex and welcome to the History Chronicles. If you like our work, then please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you'd like to support the channel in return for exclusive perks, please visit our Patreon page. Now, on with the video. Today's History Chronicle begins in New York City, a town in the midst of the Art Deco fever of the Roaring Twenties and on the brink of the worst economic disaster of the 20th century. Constructed in 1931, the Empire State Building remains one of the most recognisable buildings in the world and has become synonymous with New York City and the wider United States. This building was, at one time, the tallest building in the world although it has now been superseded by numerous towers, including others in New York. One World Trade Center and Central Park Tower being two such examples, the Empire State Building owes its existence to the life and work of two men, both of whom seemed, at first, unlikely candidates to be involved in this feat of record-breaking real estate. The first man, Alfred E. Smith, was born on the 30th of December 1873 to Joseph and Catherine Smith, from Irish and Italian families respectively, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. His Irish heritage would soon become a key part of his political campaign, and he often associated himself with the Irish-American community over the course of his life. Formerly a worker in the Tammany Hall political machine, Smith was known in New York circles as a politician and socialite, and had relatively few business connections, save those which he held to advance his political career. And despite his involvement with Tammany and its boss, Charlie Murphy, Smith avoided allegations of corruption and managed to build a political platform based on his working-class roots. Smith went on to hold several political offices in and around New York during his early career, being at various times Sheriff of New York County, 8th President of the New York City Board of Aldermen, and eventually the 42nd Governor of New York, a career through which he would become well known for his progressive policies, including workers' compensation and women's pensions. The second man, John J. Raskob, was born on the 19th of March 1879 to Anna Francis Raskob and John Raskob in Lockport, New York, a small town in Niagara County, New York State. Raskob was a businessman, but lacked any sort of connection to the real estate and construction markets, working for DuPont and then General Motors as an executive, eventually coming to head General Motors' financial division. The connection between the two men had been forged in part due to their shared hatred of prohibition. The state enforced embargo on alcohol production and distribution provided for by the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution, ratified in 1919 and eventually repealed by the 21st Amendment in 1933. Their shared Irish heritage would also provide a common base for the two men and led them to endure the abuse that this brought. It was a connection which led Raskob to make dramatic changes to his career trajectory, deciding to resign his post of General Motors to run Smith's 1928 presidential election campaign, using his position to promote Smith as a friend to businesses all over the United States. Smith had already fought to be the Democratic candidate for president in 1924 and stood on a political platform which had decried prohibition, lynching and racial violence, leading Franklin D. Roosevelt to proclaim him the happy warrior of the political battlefield. His 1928 run for president, alongside his new campaign manager Raskob, nonetheless ended in failure with the Republican candidate Herbert Hoover claiming victory with 40 states carried to Smith's eight, an outcome which many historians attribute to the economic boom over which the Republicans had presided, as well as widespread anti-Catholic sentiment against Smith and Rascal. The aftermath of the failed election run left the two men effectively unemployed. However, Raskob's significant personal fortune led him to a new venture, to build the tallest building in existence, supposedly reassuring Smith with the words, Don't worry, Al. I'm going to build the biggest skyscraper in the world, and you're going to be president of that company. Smith and Raskob turned to an architecture firm, Shreve, Lamb and Harmon, and inquired as to whether they could assist in the development of such a building, leading them to produce a design for the tallest and heaviest building in the world. The designs for the Empire State Building provided for a structure which was not actually much taller than the then record holder for the tallest building, the Chrysler Tower, giving the Empire State Building a relatively slender lead with a 15-storey height advantage. However, the scale of the building was far more impressive, with a structural weight of 65,000 tonnes to the Chrysler's 20,000. 
The next task in the development of the tower was finding a plot of land in Manhattan that would be able to accommodate its great size and weight. Although, ironically, for all of their protests against prohibition, Raskob and Smith were aided in their task by the vast number of hotels which had closed owing to their inability to sell alcohol, leaving a great number of derelict buildings available to be pulled down. The group eventually selecting the Waldorf Astoria building as the site for their new skyscraper. Many commentators were bemused by the project and suggested that the venture was ill-planned and naive. Few office towers existed at that time in the neighbourhood, and the market for office space was thought to be very low, as Fortune magazine reported at the time. More than the location of the building, Raskob was concerned with its height, harbouring a personal desire to make sure that the building was taller than its main rival, the Chrysler Building, in part owing to the fact that Raskob had formerly worked for the owners of the tower, General Motors. Indeed, the rivalry between Raskob and General Motors cut both ways. And upon hearing of Raskob's project, Walter Chrysler ordered that a flagpole of latticed steel be erected in the centre of the tower, giving it an additional few metres of height, a structure which they named a vertex. After this, the designs for the Empire State Building were modified, giving it a height of 85 storeys, which according to their blueprint raised the Empire State Building just over the modified height of the Chrysler Tower. The design of the tower was modelled on the Art Deco style, which had originated in France and, according to legend, was based on a model of a pencil for the inspiration for the building's exterior design. The sharp, straight edges complemented with a general style which was typical of the Roaring Twenties. With the design of the record-breaking tower complete, Smith and Raskob set out to tackle the challenge of finding a construction firm willing to build the tower itself first negotiating with Paul Starrett and his firm over contracts, the latter warning the men that their project would bring unusual problems, but agreeing to construct the tower for the sum of $600,000, which was eventually brought down to $500,000 after further talks. Further fears over the slight difference in height between the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building led Smith to come up with a new design feature a 158-foot tall spire, which would act as a dirigible mast for airships. This plan was once again subject to great scrutiny from the press, scrutiny which became more profound after Hugo Eckner, the captain of the Graf Zeppelin, argued that the practicalities of mooring an airship to the top of such a structure would be nigh on impossible. Although despite the tirade in the press, and even a legal report which advocated against the idea, the dirigible mast was nonetheless installed and was, as expected, seldom used. The first instance in which an airship docked to the mast was on Tuesday the 17th of December 1930. The construction of the Empire State Building itself was miraculous, a testament to the workmen who worked on the project, which saw what was then the tallest building in the world constructed in a little over 13 months. This was partially the result of the Great Depression, which first set in during the year of 1929 and made the Empire State Project one of the only opportunities for employment in the city. Many workers flocked to join the construction effort, which soon became a significant force. The design of the building was relatively simple to implement. A central space in the building was used to house the elevator, toilet facilities and corridors, and a 28-foot deep perimeter surrounding this was intended for use as office space. As one went up the building, the structure became narrower, meaning that fewer elevators could be used to access the higher floors, and the tower took on a slightly pyramid-like appearance. In addition to the appeal of the project for the unemployed, the speed of the construction process was also owed to the willingness of the designers to use materials which were immediately available, and ready-made to be constructed on site. Marble slabs, steel girders and other elements of the building were delivered to the construction site, in what was effectively a prefabricated condition, meaning that they could be easily slotted together and erected by workmen in comparatively little time. Once the Waldorf Astoria had been raised to the ground, it was in this manner that the Empire State Building was constructed, with work on the building proper commenced on the 17th of March 1930. The speed at which the building went up was widely noted at the time, with Paul Starrett, the construction boss, paying homage to Lamb's design, indicating that it was simple to implement and was a key factor in allowing his building teams to make such good progress on the project, a sentiment which Lamb returned in kind, indicating the efficiency with which Starrett had organised his labour force. The speed of the construction process was also significantly aided by the lack of unfortunate events which could have plagued its progress. Marble was still obtained from Italy, 
despite its political unrest, and there were no delays to the development from bad weather or technological glitches. For instance, train delays and derailments, which could have very easily impeded the acquisition of steel girders coming into Manhattan and Pennsylvania. The day for workers was long and hard. Construction commenced at 8am sharp, followed by a break at noon for lunch, with work ceasing at 4.30pm, a time which would be signalled by a whistle, informing the workers that their day was done. Men from all over the city and the country arrived on site every single day. The air split with the sound of hundreds of voices and the cacophony of bangs and whines generated from the hand tools and drills used by the workers to complete their tasks. Over the course of the day, dozens of trucks arrived at the construction site, carrying materials and wares, often driven over from the east side docks, where ships from nearby states as well as Europe landed with the commodities needed to erect the great structure of the Empire State Building. The whole project provided a much-needed source of employment for the depression-worn population of New York, and Starrett subsequently found that he was never short of workers as a result, with shipping companies all over the country eager to sell and ship their wares to New York for this purpose, lubricating the construction process and aiding in the development of the skyscraper, which soon became a symbol of hope for the whole US population in the midst of such economic turmoil. Al Smith himself helped in the construction process, albeit to a minuscule extent, when he laid the cornerstone of the building once the foundations had been completed, containing within it a box filled with items related to the 1920s, what some would call today a time capsule, although many of the articles in the box were effectively useless and were used to advertise Smith and his firm. He nonetheless stated, if this building is ever demolished to make way for a greater building, the people of that day can pretty accurately read the history of this day. The Empire State Building shot up once the foundations had been completed, and workers soon found themselves working and resting hundreds of stories above the streets of New York. Starrett was evidently concerned for the well-being and safety of his workers, and demonstrated this by anchoring two safety scaffolds below each story as it went up, both of which had the appearance of large fishing nets, designed to break the fall of anyone who toppled from their place. Although, interestingly, there are no records which show any worker having to make use of this facility. Indeed, the bravery of the workforce soon attracted the attention of the press and the people of New York, who would crowd around the base of the Empire State Building and gaze up at the workers who scurried back and forth hundreds of metres above them, with a reporter from the New York Times calling the whole construction effort the best show in town. The whole workforce, according to the New York Times, consisted of over 3,000 men. 225 carpenters, 290 bricklayers, 328 arch labourers and 105 electricians, amongst many other workers who performed the various general and skilled professions required to put the whole building together. Many of these workers remained in the building for the duration of their workday, remaining in place even during their lunch hours when they would be served from restaurants established dozens of storeys above ground level, their hard work and dedication greater enforced by the knowledge that if they did not perform at maximum capacity, there were many thousands of men willing to line up for their place. Indeed, the rate of pay for the profession was relatively high, and workers were rewarded for particularly hard work, earning a bonus on top of their wage for recognition in this capacity, some tradesmen taking home a tidy sum upwards of $16 a day, which was much more than subway workers who earned 36 cents an hour by comparison. One of the most important tasks was fulfilled by members of a riveting team, who connected the steel girders which arrived, often warm from the steel mills over the River Hudson on a daily basis, an effective team reportedly managing to secure over 500 rivets a day, allowing the skeleton of the building to be hastily erected, ready for subsequent teams to complete their various tasks and thrust the skyscraper yet further into the air. Workers maintained close relationships with one another, an essential aspect of a workforce which looked to one another to safeguard their collective well-being, and they fostered this by spending lunch breaks eating, talking and playing cards hundreds of metres above the ground, a scene reminiscent of the photograph Lunch Atop a Skyscraper, which although depicting workers eating during the 1930s, and therefore similar to scenes on the Empire State construction site, was actually taken of a construction crew working in 1932 on the Rockefeller Centre. Construction efforts continued in this manner until May 1931, when the process was declared complete, and the building formally opened to great ceremony. 
the workers who delivered this staggering feat of human engineering and endeavour often disappearing into relative or complete obscurity. The show stolen by figures as influential as President Herbert Hoover, who turned on the power to the site from his office in Washington DC. The opening ceremony for the Empire State Building was a scene of great pomp and ceremony. Al Smith's two grandchildren cutting a large red ribbon over the Fifth Avenue entrance to the building's foyer, with New York Governor and later President Franklin Roosevelt and Mayor Jimmy Walker looking on, President Hoover sending his personal congratulations for the completion of the building. The building was well received amongst the wider public, with many commenting on the clean lines and symmetrical aspect of the skyscraper, which towered as the tallest structure in New York, and at that point, in the whole world. A title it would hold until the completion of the World Trade Center in 1970, a symbol of hope, prosperity and endeavor which resonated strongly amongst the depression-worn population of New York and the entire United States. However, despite the power of the image conjured up by the building itself, it remained largely empty for the remainder of the 1930s due to the onset of the effects of the Great Depression, and was only fully utilized after the Second World War, during the economic and commercial boom of the 1950s, which saw the shops and offices finally occupied by firms wealthy enough to house themselves in this record-breaking tower. Indeed, the lack of immediate patronage from businesses forced Smith and Raskov to come up with a new way of making money from their titanic investment, leading them to effectively turn the tower into a tourist attraction, developing viewing platforms on the 86th and 102nd floors of the skyscraper, which remained open to the general public until 1am, and provided a source of income for their group, which would remain a cornerstone of the economies of both the firm and the city of New York to this day. The Empire State Building would soon become synonymous with New York and the wider United States. At 1,472 feet high with its 102 storeys, plus the dirigible tower, and a full half a block wide, it was the Art Deco embodiment of the Roaring Twenties, embodying the hopes and dreams of millions during the Great Depression. According to their website, the Empire State Building now attracts an average of 4 million visitors every year who flock to the observation decks to take in the view of the Manhattan skyline, an enduring reminder of the passion, endeavor, and brash capitalist competition of New Yorkers during the 1920s. It remains a potent symbol of the spirit of the city to this day. You have been watching the History Chronicles. We'd love to know what you think of the Empire State Building. Please let us know below, and if you enjoyed our video, then please give us a like and subscribe. It really helps us out. Also, if you'd like to support our work going forward, please visit our Patreon page. And we look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of the History Chronicles.